anyway, it's not kosher, David. So it, it, it's great to have you back. And uh, I'm curious what's on your radar, David. You know, the action here has been uh, quiet. Uh, are, are we already in the dog days of summer? Uh, the ranges seem to be compressing. Uh, is that a market tell to you in any way? I mean, when you think of adjectives you would use to describe the, the market, I mean, phrases like tired, <laughs> sluggish, okay. stalling, yeah. those are the kind of words that I hear myself using that I hear others using. And I think that's, that's yeah. totally accurate. And it's, it's not just the, the directional trends. So if you look at the S&P, if you look at the NASDAQ, it's yeah. gone from an established uptrend to a decidedly sideways trend, right? I mean, we, we really yeah. made the push to new highs in April, and then we've stalled at that point. I mean, that, that's sort of the level. And for the NASDAQ, it's around 14,000 on the NASDAQ 100. On the S&P, it's just below 4,250. And right. the real question, as volumes have been lighter than average uh, here in, in recent weeks, you know, the question is, what's the catalyst? What's the, you know, what's going to take control and push uh, and, and push stocks higher if that's what's going to happen? And, and you have you have stocks like Facebook and Alphabet that look very, very good and are breaking out just fine. But you also have stocks like Tesla and Apple and Amazon, mega cap names that are at the lower end yeah. of their range, you know, for the last couple months even. So that that sort of indecision, that spread between what's working and what's not is what's making the market sort of sideways right now. So are we strongly neutral? You haven't heard that adjective. <laughs> well, uh, so for, I think for a while, I, I, think that? The, <laughs> I think the question has been less, you know, are, is the market positive or negative? We love to simplify the bullish or bearish. And, right. and that's totally fine because I think, you know, at least having a binary, you know, decision forces you to have an opinion. It forces you into one side. But to be honest, I think it's a, it's a question less about are the markets in an uptrend, but what's the upside potential, right? What What is the... You know what's the 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 chance of a meaningful upside move from here, and that's where I would I would argue it's fairly limited, and yeah, you I, see that from you know when you look at individual names, when you look at groups, when you look at things like semiconductors, which are you know overall have been struggling on a relative basis in the last couple right. of months. That the market goes meaningfully higher when those types of names are rotating to the upside, not when they're struggling at the lower end of their range. Yeah, I'm surprised that the market hasn't made more hay out of yields dropping from, you know, back under one and a half, uh, you know, from we were in the 170s and really hasn't made much hay with that, hasn't made much hay with a weaker dollar. Um, I'm trying to think of catalysts in here, Dave, and uh, the only thing I could think of is, you know, no one thinks there's going to be an infrastructure or there's doubt about the infrastructure stimulus Maybe that could be a catalyst or uh, we have the Fed next week, but what else could they say that could be stimulative to the market as they, you know, get readings like they had today in CPI? So that's exactly it, right? And and in the absence of an upside catalyst, I think what we're seeing is that that the market's really not able to move to move higher significantly. You mentioned yields and I, you know, I've talked for a while. I think that you know, if there was one chart to make sense of things, I think, you know, it was either the twos 10 spread, the TNX, maybe the 10 year yield, um, yeah, the TLT, 10 year yield the bond yeah. prices. This is yeah. the spread between the 10 year and the two year. So it shows you the shape of the yield curve. So if this is going up, the yield curve is steepening. If this is going right. down, the yield curve is flattening. And, and, and if you look, I mean, the, the yield curve was really just accelerating to the upside right. through the first quarter, <clears throat> sort of sideways for the last couple of months. But just now breaking down for the first time since, you know, summer of 2020. Uh, and, you know, that should be a headwind for things like financials, obviously. Yeah, I was just going to say that. On that curve, right? So yeah. Yeah. that coming down should be a headwind for financials. That that makes sense because if you look at the charts of Goldman and JP Morgan and, and a lot of the asset managers, they've had really, really good runs and arguably could use a bit of a break if they're, if they're going to have a sustainable move after this. Um, you know, but but again, bond prices have broken out. The TLT has gone uh, has gone to the upside. Yields have uh, uh, have broken down back below one and a half percent. Have you really yeah. seen the market dramatically blow out? As in, this is a you know the all clear for growth stocks, and and you're seeing it on a limited basis, but it's not a broad rotation back into into growth. And and to be honest with you, I think remember yields and and bonds can move for a number of different reasons, but. You know, one thing is you could have just a rotation away from stocks into bonds, and potentially we're seeing the beginning of that rotation here. 
um, okay. with bonds breaking out, but that would mean you'd have to see stocks breaking down, which you're really not seeing on a broad broad scale yet. Yeah, I, I keep looking at that S and P chart, and it it seems to, you know, for people that are trying to time some type of top, uh, the, they're probably getting FOMO right now because I feel it too. But I'm trying to sit on my hands for you know um, a higher target up around forty three hundred or so to see if we get there. Uh, I wanted to ask you about what you thought about miners, which have not really kept up with the price of bullion, which is kind of the opposite of how it should be. Normally the miners lead and gold has made successive new highs. And uh, that gap that it left on the way down um, uh, bothers me a little bit. What do you think? Uh, is this a pullback to buy in in the miners? So, I mean, overall, I think so. I, I think the strength in commodities, I don't think we're anywhere near done with that. Um, I think yeah. I think it was Blake just a little bit ago talking about oil. Um, and and I get, I mean, I when I'm looking at the chart of crude oil, when I'm looking at most commodities, I'm seeing a broad uptrend. And the question is, are we in a tactical pullback or, you know, and, and resuming the uptrend? And and that's that's my sort of default way of thinking of this, just given the strength in that space. And I think the potential there. So you're right, though, in, in if if in a, in a vacuum, if everything's kind of normal, you'd see the XAU, the GDX and others, you know, really propelling and, and, and sort of leading on the way to the upside. But they really aren't. Uh, and, and I think the XAU is a perfect chart to be watching right now to sort of gauge that because we hit sort of the August peak. We have this you know, this beautiful basing pattern, which is just a yeah. you know, consolidation pattern between 130 and 165. We're right back up there. This is really close to making what we call a cup and handle pattern, which is a big rounded bottom and then a shallower pullback before we propel to new highs. And a, and a, and a, a break above 165 would really give the green light to that thesis. Yeah. And, you know, very simply so, at the very least yeah. men, you know, measures up to, you know, 190, 200 ish range. Yeah, I concur for another high. Uh, you know, a lot of things are, you know, moving sideways and, you know, elioticians are calling a wave four, which implies one more rally to the upside in, in yeah. many markets, including S&Ps, that this could be a four or a triangle and we get one more thrust. Um, you know, I'd like you to pull up, uh, you brought up Tesla. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, you know, I've been writing and tweeting a little bit about Tesla and I want to compare what uh, I'm seeing with uh, what you're seeing because you're you're a licensed uh, trained technician and I'm just a, I am a professional I, Dale huh <laughs> what I am a professional you're right thank you you are you are you're a pro and you know and I'm just uh, a runner that decides how you know I'm going to learn how to trade so you have the same thing there David you have a a descending triangle yeah. and and you know that the implications of that is pretty negative and you know you have to say that Tesla before the was a meme stock before there were meme stocks, right? Well, I was going to say when you're looking at the chart of Tesla, when you're looking at the chart of Bitcoin, when you're looking at the Ark Innovation Fund, I would argue they're all showing kind of a similar story, which is you know a, a number of new participants in recent years, and it's really accelerated, and they've gravitated towards sort of the meme names, right? Sort of the, these yeah. these thematic plays, and Tesla was sort of the the example before you started to have some others that that are all telling a similar story. They've all had incredible runs, which is absolutely right. Um, yeah. But then if you look at any of those charts that I just mentioned, and we're looking at Tesla, which is a perfect example, there's there's very little encouraging about this chart, I would argue, from a technical perspective. This is a, a classic rotation from accumulation mode on the first two thirds of the chart to distribution mode on the right side of the chart, where breakdown, you know, every breakdown. Yeah, go ahead, David. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, so, you know, what, what makes that the case is just, you know, a couple of things. Number one, we've gone from a consistent pattern of higher highs where every time buyers come in and, you know, we break out, we make a new high from the previous one. That's what Charles Dow said 100 plus years ago, that that's what an uptrend, how you define it. And that stopped happening. You now have Tesla making lower highs and, and all the other things that I mentioned. Um, you're breaking support, right? So you, So instead of holding the previous swing low on a pullback, you're starting to break it. And I think the real, the tell for, for Tesla was right about here in mid-February. When you broke below the January low, you broke below the 50-day moving average, which 
holding the 50 day during an uptrend is sort of a standard, you know, basic measure of, is this a long-term uptrend and, and just a tactical pullback, or is this something that's deeper and more, you know, that, that I have to be more risk aware. And I think that signal there in, in mid to late February was the indication that this could be, you know, a deeper correction in terms of price and or time. And I think we're seeing a, a little of both here. The last one that I would mention, so the RSI is the second panel here. This is one of the best ways to, to measure this transition. If you look at Tesla sort of in the middle of this chart, you can yeah. see what a bullish phase looks like where the, yeah. the stock's rallying, the RSI goes above 70. When it pulls back, it never really gets below 40. And that's sort of what a bullish phase looks like, right? Because people are buying in on weakness. The momentum right. never really gets too negative and we go to the next high. Look at how all that changed about that time I mentioned in February. Now, all of a sudden, we're becoming oversold when the stock pulls back. When we rally, we're not getting above an RSI of 60. And that's more of a market in a bearish phase where you know buyers aren't able to propel it to, a, you know, to, to an overbought condition, meaning not enough buyers are really pushing it higher. So also, my... my uh Go ahead. I was going to say my overall, just my overall way of thinking of something like Tesla, you know, overall my bias would be lower. And I think you're right. You saw the descending triangle, which is a static support level, and then descending highs on the upper end. I've sort of indicated it with the trend lines. When you're looking at a stock like this, it's all about the pattern and then the trigger. So the pattern is a descending triangle. Absolutely right. That's confirmed. The trigger is a break below 550, which would take it below that pattern, it would take it below the lows of May and March. And I think if that happens, which I think it is going to, um, then that measures down to around 400, which would make it in line with these lows from the fourth quarter of last year and make a ton of sense from a, uh, from a chart perspective. Okay, good. It almost looks like uh, from the low that you had in uh, March and the bounce you had into April, that the same level of support happening in May is a much weaker bounce off major support and almost a fractal of what happened prior in March, the bounce that, that we're in from May. Uh, that's exactly weaker. right. I actually yeah. have a measured move. I mean, the whole formation looks to be $350 about, David. So I know yeah, you don't so want to Yeah, so it depends on, on how you measure it. If you, if you take just the height of the pattern, you're right. It sort of gets you down to the 300 350 range. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, oils have turned into uh, really being embraced. I saw Tom Lee on CNBC embrace them, said something like a uh, hodl on oil and, you know, <laughs> Uh, people, huh? <laughs> they're know, using the memes on crude oil now. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. So, I mean, they're really embracing uh, WTI and, you know, saying that uh, investors are scarred from, you know, going negative. And really, it's been an underperformer for, what, a decade or so. Uh, yeah. It's a very small part of the S&Ps now. Uh, what are you thinking in here? Besides uh, WTI approaching 70, uh, any of the oil shares still look attractive after a run like this? Yeah, it's fascinating. I, and, and, and I'm always looking for anecdotal evidence. My wife just mentioned yesterday that um, it was 420 a gallon for the premium yeah. gas around us in the Seattle area yesterday. And if you're thinking yeah. of where that came from not too long ago, right? But yeah. when, when my wife mentioning the price of oil, that tells you we've had an acceleration to the upside, which is what we've, right. what we've certainly <laughs> had, right? And, and if you yeah. look, I mean, if you look at the trend, it's, it's, a, it's a clear breakout pattern, uh, you know, hitting the high earlier this year, yeah. rotating back to the upside, breaking above resistance. You know, if you look at the continuous contract, getting above highs from, you know, the pre-sell-off in 2020, um, it's a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant run. Um, and you know what I what I like about the energy trade, and I think there's more upside to those names. I mean, they've had really good runs. This is the XLE that we're looking at. Um, they've had really good runs, but but still, I don't see anything on the chart to be to be uh, upset about or to be cautious about yet. Um, you know, overall, it's it's holding up well. And I think if you if you look at where speculation has been, it's been elsewhere. It's been in clean energy. It's been in technology communications names. Um, you know, you've not seen a lot of, uh, of, of chatter talking about, you know, energy or industrials or materials, sort of the, you know, boring cyclicals, but that have had incredible, incredible runs. And so I, I think I like the fact that this is something where people are not used to seeing, you know, a lot of investors that are just starting um, have not seen oil prices do what they're doing right now and have not seen energy stocks be leadership. And I think that's what potentially gives it an opportunity to continue to surprise to uh, to the upside. And I, and I see further strength in commodities. And I think 
uh, energy is going to continue to do to do just fine. Okay, well, the dollar, David, is uh, just a shade off its January low of 89.20. And, you know, I was always taught that during dollar declines that you should look overseas. Are, mm. Is there anything uh, that you like uh, uh, with the dollar continuing to decline, even though I think we're much closer to a capitulation low than a dollar crash? Um, anything in foreign markets that look good to you? Yeah, it's, and it's interesting. I mean, when you look at the chart of the dollar, uh, the, you know, the question it, when we talk about stocks and think about the upside potential, right? What is there? Is there limited yeah. upside in stocks? I think the inverse is what you could think with the dollar. I mean, you're coming off of right. a significant low in January. This could set up to be an incredible double bottom pattern where you find support around the same level. Um, yeah. And the question is, do you have, you know, what, what's the downside from there, right? If you if you break it, but I was also 60. taught in my career, Dale, don't don't confuse the bottom of the page with support. <laughs> so so oh, yeah. remember the dollar <laughs> could go low, I, right? I, so, I've been you know dazed and confused doing that. So yeah, all right, that's a great one, David. But you know, so I mean, it, I, I've always taught <laughs> things and things and uptrends assume that they will con- need to continue until proven otherwise, and and the dollar's right. in a downturn until I see evidence of. A rotation higher. I have to assume that the path of least resistance is is down. And I think, as you mentioned, that what that would suggest is, um, you know, non U.S. markets should be looking pretty decent here. And overall, if you look at the average market, if you look at India, um, if you look at uh, you know Germany, France. Now a lot of that is obviously the the weaker dollar that's making those look so attractive. But the charts are pretty good. And these ETFs that I'm showing, by the way, a lot of the iShares ETFs is how. You know, many U.S. based investors would make plays on some of these non-U.S. markets. So it has a, a certainly a dollar impact in there. But I but I think that's how a lot of people would get exposure. Um, but, you know, I'm seeing a lot of charts that are fairly constructive here. Uh, Brazil is arguably one of the better ones. And the EWZ, right. again, it's it's similar to the XLE chart. So it's the energy chart that we were looking at. Um, and uh, in the short term, it's overbought, out. which is. Yeah, it's it's yeah. been a nice bounce to break out of this base, which is which is really good. Yeah. It's overbought in the short term, just coming out of that. So, could you see a, a a short term pullback? Absolutely, and I think we might be right at the time where you see that. But my question is, is that a tactical you know entry point on a on a chart that's overall very constructive? And I think that's how yeah. I would I would tend to treat it. Where you're seeing weakness, or you're seeing relative weakness, is uh, is in Asian markets really. Um, you know, Japan yeah, was one that. Looked really, really good going into the beginning of the year and has stalled and uh, has sort of just kind of come off. It's sort of flustering, floundering around sideways, uh, but well below its February highs, while a lot of markets are sort of at or near or or breaking up to new highs. Um, so I'm not seeing as much to, to appreciate on the chart of Japan. And then China, this is the FXI, which is a common uh, China right. ETF. Uh, you know, overall well off the February highs, really has been in consolidation mode for the last two months. And the, and the way that I think of a chart like this, by the way, is it's all about a range bound environment, the FXI is between 48 and 43.50 or so, which was the low from uh, last month. And the question is, at some point, we break out of that range. Do we break out to the upside, break above 48? Do we continue to, to go lower? And, and again, I have to assume that the path uh, continues lower until proven otherwise, until you get some sort of higher low that confirms that uh, that the uh, that the downtrend has abated but the relative strength being so negative tells you why it's been uh, it's been a tough market to, to get exposure to yeah right now. you know most people wouldn't think that I mean they recovered from covid uh, faster than anyone they still have uh, you know the fastest economic growth everyone's so worried about China maybe they should look at the FX chart FXI chart and compare it to the s p and maybe they wouldn't be as worried. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to wrap it with um, a little bit on crypto, and I'm pretty sure you probably follow GBTC, that uh, that trust. Do you, David? Sure. Of course, yeah. Follow any? I mean, it's hard not to follow it after what's happened over the last uh, year or so. And uh, I'm wondering, as a, as a technician, uh, we had uh, you know a huge bull run. And we pulled back. Um, looks like we're starting to fill some gaps. Anything you see in this chart? You know, I said yesterday Bitcoin actually had a false breakdown, and GBTC, same thing. You had that big gap. You had that gap down the day before yesterday, and then yeah. yesterday you gap back up. Uh, what's the message there? Is that an island? 
So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, you call it a number of things. I'd probably just call it a, a hammer candle, right? Which is the op open and close sort of at the upper end of the range in a long lower shadow. And, you know, think of it, I, and I like that illustration because you think of it as hammering out a bottom. That's, you know, we yeah. open at a certain point in a downtrend, we trade much lower, but by the end of the day, we've rallied back to the to the highs of the day. And, and it's as, about as bullish as it sounds, right? It, it shows that, Traders are accumulating. So in the short term, absolutely right. I think that's a nice bounce indication. I mean, if you look at the chart of Bitcoin, um, it's it's incredibly volatile, right? Which is an yeah. understatement. I mean, there, there's huge volatility that I think if you're used to looking at stocks or other assets, uh, it's a it's a next level volatility that you have to be mentally prepared for. But I do think that you know a lot of the traditional measures can still be very very helpful. And I think that you know when I'm looking at the GBTC or I'm looking at Bitcoin. Short-term bounce aside, overall, it's similar to the chart of Tesla in that you've seen a rotation from accumulation, accumulation mode to distribution mode. Okay. Um, you know, Bitcoin, obviously, an incredible run up to 64,000 and then an incredible rotation lower. And it, it's a, for, I think for a lot of investors, the chart of Bitcoin is their experience right now, which is you're, you're seeing a market that seems to have limitless upside. And then all of a sudden it changes to something that seems to have limitless downside. And that is a lesson that I'm sure you learned earlier in your career. And I know I learned you have painful lessons like that, that teach you yeah. risk management and teach you how to bet size and teach you how to think about drawdowns. And, and I think for a lot of newer investors that are just getting into crypto and that's their introduction, I think this is providing some really good, this is the tuition you're paying to learn uh, to learn about investing. So um, either so, pay I mean, to learn or pay the markets. That, that's right. That's right. And I think with GBTC, the other, you know, the other thing to remember, I think for a lot of people have thought of the GBTC as just a an ETF like product to access Bitcoin. But if you look at the returns, I mean, GBTC has not really matched the returns of Bitcoin very well. And it it rotated from trading at a, at a significant premium to trading more at a discount. And so the returns were much more muted on the GBTC versus Bitcoin. So especially in the first quarter, had you owned GBTC, you weren't really gaining a lot while Bitcoin was up, oh, you know, 30, 40 percent. That's a great insight. So yeah, uh, and it's 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 all, it, it happens with a lot of commodity ETFs. That's, you know, with the USO, yeah. with the UUP, yeah. there's this dislocation. And you're, you're seeing that with this, too. So I, I especially as people are looking for ways to access Bitcoin without, you know, opening, having a digital wallet and all of that, I would just say, you know, make sure you understand the structure of them and and, uh, and look at the return profile. The charts, are just, just look at the relative performance, you can see the return profiles. Okay, um, let me ask you this, David, and it's just theoretical. Um, if you were looking to, say you thought there was gonna be a 10% or larger correction in the market over the net, you know, even though maybe we haven't peaked yet, what would be your preferred way of capitalizing on it uh, because, you know, th there are a lot of uh, ETFs that, you know, do not measure up to market performance on both the up and the downside. Uh, mm -hmm. What would be your preferred way to take advantage of a bear market besides getting uh, or a pretty large correction, almost maybe comparable to what we had during the COVID crash? How would you trade that? What instruments would you be focused on? So it's a really, really good question, Dale. I, and I think, you know, I am, I am, I am sort of having that in mind. If you look at the NASDAQ 100 recently, just in the year to date, you've had pullbacks of about 8%, pullbacks of about 12%, I think, have been the two. The S&P has yeah. been a little less, right? About a 4.5% pullback recently, but earlier in the year, you know, 4 to 6%. Um, you know, so how do you play a pullback that's that or even deeper, right? That you would, you would retrace even further. There are a couple of ways to do it. I think it depends on your risk assessment, how, how, how comfortable you are. I, I rarely would suggest leveraged ETF, and I'm and I you won't hear me say it, but I will tell you that if you're if you're an aggressive investor and you understand the risk and you understand the dynamics of those, I think there could be an opportunity for some of those leveraged ETFs, of bearish ETFs that have obviously not been a great general bet recently. And I think a lot of people are treating them as long term holdings, which is just not how they were designed. And it's really not a great use of that of that vehicle. But I would say if you're seeing a, a potential drawdown that there, there are going to be some, uh, you know, leveraged bearish ETFs that will do very, very well based on, on a pullback. Uh, so that's probably where I would look uh, initially. Like quid and, or SQQQ? 
Absolutely, right. Some of those, uh, some okay. of those inverse sort of leverage ETFs, SQQQ probably comes to mind as a good one, given the volatility that you've seen in the Nasdaq and and the um, and the pullbacks that have been a little more extreme than in uh, than in the S and P. But the other thing I would say is, I, I think as a trend follower, if you're not an aggressive investor, I think as a trend follower, you look at what's working and you stick with that. And I would be looking at sectors like real estate. I would be looking at high dividend pairs. This has a you know these stocks have different dis- decent dividends, and it's things like. Simon Property Group, SPG, Iron Mount, Mountain, uh, IRM. A REIT? Yeah, REITs are pretty boring and you probably never look at them. But if you look at the chart of real estate, which is what we're doing right now, REITs have been absolutely fantastic and they've performed well on yeah. an absolute basis, on a relative basis, and they have good dividends. And so I, I think in a, in a period of market pullback, going to the relative safety of something like this could actually be a great way to, to ride something out. So I, I, depending on how aggressive or conservative you would be, those would be the ways I would think about it. All right, great ideas. Uh, it's kind of like a bond proxy in a way, isn't it? That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. All right, David, why don't you show us your website? Uh, uh, and David and uh, I concur, David is uh, not just a professional. He's There are many pros. He's a major, <laughs> he's a major leaguer. <laughs> okay, so uh, th- so this is uh, you could find David on stock charts. Uh, you do a little show there. That's exactly and- right. So go to stockcharts.com if you're not familiar with with what we do. Our, our job is to empower investors to make better decisions. And yeah. uh, if you're interested in technical analysis, investor psychology, this is where we um, have a lot of great content. There's a free version that you're welcome to use, and then we have member versions which. Uh, have a lot greater capability capabilities and my show as you mentioned dale which uh which which it looks like we'll get you on very soon which will be a lot of fun to have you on my show um uh, i'm on stock charts tv end of every day uh, our closing bell show so check that out uh, after the close and then my youtube channel is called market misbehavior so if anything i described about uh about technical indicators and i'm showing moving averages or fibonacci yeah. retracements you didn't quite follow it uh, go to my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of uh, explanations of how to apply different technical approaches to different different current charts. You know, David, I want to thank you for uh, really having uh, a great demeanor for when people get emotional when they talk about money and markets moving around. Your demeanor even calms uh, a nervous guy like me down. So uh, I appreciate your analysis. Uh, I'm so glad to have you in the rotation and um, hope that all your ideas uh, turn green for you and all of your subscribers and followers. I appreciate it, Phil. Be well. Thanks again for having me on. All right. David Keller, everyone. And uh, follow David at Market Misbehavior. He's got a nice YouTube channel there as well. So, um, uh, you know, he's definitely a follow on Twitter for everyone that hears my voice to get... um, at least used to someone who has a discipline to, uh, you know, keep you with what's happening in the market, not what you're projecting on the market. So thank you, David. You helped me today. So that's it. My trading warrior brother and everyone, I'll see everyone tomorrow. We'll wrap up the week. Good luck with the rest of the day. And remember, don't just count your shares, your coins, your crypto, count your blessings. And adios. Bye-bye. Same to you guys. You're welcome. You're welcome. David, saying you're welcome. All right. Great interview, David. Adios.